Welcome, welcome everybody to our first webinar edition, uh, Bulgaria Meets UK, the best practice uh, exchange on children hospital care. Today's event uh, is organized by the British Embassy and I want to give a special thanks and appreciation to Her Majesty's Ambassador to Bulgaria, Dr. Rob Dixon, and his professional team that supported the idea and make it for real. Our next co-organizer is uh, British Bulgarian Business Association that is the heart of establishment of a strong relationship between Bulgaria and UK. And of course, Health and Life Science Cluster Bulgaria and Dejan Borgoyev for his, uh, for, who inspired us for this event. I am Christina Eskenazi and today I'll be your host and I promise you a really useful and uh, positive meeting. This webinar is broadcasted and delivered by the support of premium co-working space and I want to special thanks to them also. For our audience, uh, you can ask your questions uh, in Q Q a Q&A uh, button as uh, you can see on the, the screens and uh, during all the event we will expect uh, not only your question but also your opinion and proposal that how we can improve the, the meeting and of course if you have something spe uh, specific to ask uh, the lector I will be I will switch uh, on in Bulgarian just for a minute to explain translational uh, rules and regulation into the zoom platforms Ако искате да превключите на български език, от организаторите сме осигурили превод. Трябва да натиснете бутона, както е показано на вашите екрани, с глобощето да изберете руски, което не е нарочно, не е руски езика, който ще чуем, напротив български, но просто самата платформа на Zoom ако ни ограничи. Благодаря ви много и ще очакваме вашите въпроси и на български, и на английски. Thank you very much. Again, I will switch on in English. What we can expect today, UK leading hospital and key Bulgarian healthcare organization will share experience and best practices and discuss the challenges and opportunities in the area of children hospital care. I will start with some information about the situation in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is the only country in European Union without a specialized children hospital that was necessary, uh, that having a necessary medical departments for children healthcare. At the end of 2018, the Bulgarian government restarted the project that was launched uh, originally in 1970. We all know that for having a modern high-tech hospital requires a modern mindset and the clear policies. And this is actually the goal of our today's meeting. The UK uh, has excellent high-tech children hospitals and it is seen as a leader in children healthcare. Sharing the best practices, solution and policy uh, in construction and management of children hospital is highly necessary at the moment in Bulgaria. Today, representatives of two leading hospitals in UK will share their experience and best practices the, uh, with the Bulgarian government, local hospital, doctors, health experts, etc. Also, we hope that uh, the webinar will help us to identify opportunities for future bilateral cooperation and this uh, in this field. Uh, now it, uh, we will start our first panel of discussion. It is time to uh, open with, uh, and I will provide, uh, give a stage for a video opening speech by uh, Her Majesty Ambassador to Bulgaria, Dr. Rob Dixon. Dear Deputy Minister Nacheva, dear Mr. Babalov, dear Mr. Lee, Ms. May, the representatives of Bulgarian National Organization, Medical University. Dear colleagues, I'm very pleased to welcome you today to the first UK Bulgarian webinar on children's hospital care, organized by the British Embassy Sofia, the Bulgarian Health and Life Sciences Cluster, and the British Bulgarian Business Association. I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person. Children's hospitals play a central role in advancing the health uh, outcomes for all children and creating healthy futures. From prevention to critical care, children's hospitals meet the healthcare needs of children 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And in the UK, we have 34 children's and paediatric hospitals, providing a large share of the professional training for the sector. And we're rightly proud of these specialist paediatric centres, which offer excellent expert care to children and young people from right across the country, providing the best possible environment, both for patients and their families. 
Children's hospitals lead health improvement initiatives that yield long-term benefits, including healthier adult populations and workforces, and avoiding countless costs later down the line, including chronic health problems. Building the most modern, high-tech children's hospital requires a totally different mindset and clear policies. Where successful, attention is paid not only to technological solutions, but the interaction between different medical departments and the psychosocial needs of both patients and doctors. And I'm very glad that we have two of the leading children's hospitals in the UK, Great Ormond Street Hospital in London and Older Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool. Great Ormond Street Hospital is the first and largest dedicated specialist children's hospital in the UK and one of the top five children's hospitals in the world. It has been continually growing and expanding over 168 years on from its establishment, providing children health care, including for rare and difficult to treat diseases and conditions, with over 300,000 admissions a year. And in 2015, Older Hay Hospital became Europe's first children's hospital built in a park, designed and chosen by young people. The hospital is the first UK centre for excellence for childhood lupus and one of four national centres for childhood epilepsy conditions, among others. Alderhead treats over 200,000 children from across the UK every year. And I'm really pleased that through this webinar, we're able to share best practices, solutions and policies in the construction and management of children's hospitals in the UK. I really hope this meeting provides a useful opportunity for our Bulgarian friends and partners here today who are involved in the management and building of uh, the first Bulgarian Children's Hospital. And I'm really pleased that Deputy Minister Ms. Nacheva has been able to join us here today. And I hope the sharing of experience is very helpful to you all. As an embassy, we look forward to continuing to work with our Bulgarian partners to deepen our cooperation in health. And I wish you a very helpful, uh, a very constructive meeting here today. All the very best. Thank you. It was really inspirational and motivation speech, and I hope this um, webinar will be useful for all sides. Now it's time uh, to provide uh, the word uh, for uh, other keystones of our webinar. This is uh, Ms. Jenny Nacheva, who is the Deputy Minister in Bulgaria, Ministry of Health. Good morning, Ms. Nacheva. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry uh, that uh, uh, my name is Dimitar Dobrev. Uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, Ms. Jane Nacheva. I'm sorry that she's not here at the moment. Uh, my task is um, to, to collect questions and the information which will be provided. And we expect, uh, we hope that uh, the Deputy Minister, uh, Ms. Jane Nacheva, will join us. Um, shortly uh, just just to, to inform you that um, on behalf of the deputy minister we would like to thank the british embassy and all the organizers for kind, kindly um, uh, inviting bulgaria to this uh, co webinar uh, we would like to highlight the importance of the uh, topic uh, children's hospital care uh, which is very sensitive for the Bulgarian population. Although this topic is very specific and uh, complex, uh, it brings together uh, leadership, partnership, efficient strategy, and proper organization. Bulgaria is extremely committed to create national multi-profile pediatric hospital, and so far, we have uh, foreseen the financial resources and we have fixed the location for this uh, multi-profile pediatric hospital. The project includes design in three phases, construction, furnishing medical equipment and construction of installation of the hospital with a capacity for now of 350 beds for inpatient children and 50 outpatient. Uh, and 50 uh, outpatient uh, um, possibilities for um, for out outpatient care for children. And we, uh, we foresee the following structure of the hospital. Uh, we have pulmonology clinic, 
Neonatology Clinic, Ears, Nose and Throat Clinic, Children's Eye Clinic, Neurology Clinic, Genetics Clinic, Clinic of Endocrinology and Diabetes, uh, Rheumatology Clinic, Clinic of Gastroenterology, Clinic of Nephrology, Course, Clinic of Childhood Clinical Hematology and Oncology, and Clinic for Intensive Care and uh, Emergency Ward, of course. We foresee operational unit without cardiac surgery, surgery also, diagnostic consultative block, and image diagnostics clinic. Um, we, uh, we hope that uh, today we will receive and we will get um, important information um, from the colleague from uh, United Kingdom and of course data for best practices practices and uh, of course if you have any questions we will be happy to collect them and to to send you answers in proper time thank you very much thank you thank you Dmitry can you please share with us what is your job position because it wasn't so clear sorry I'm sorry um I am expert in the international directorate, directorate in the Ministry of Health. Thank you. And uh, I have one question. Uh, what is the stage of uh, this project that you share with us? Uh, well, <laughs> on which stage? You mentioned that there is a three stages uh, plan, but where are we right now? We are, uh, we are at the beginning. We have at the moment, we have at the moment um, signed contract. Uh, uh, with and um, actually, this is uh, at the moment we have uh, signed contract and uh, contract part party uh, shall start uh, okay. the, the installation of the, of the hospital. Okay, thank you. I hope that uh, any question that may uh, bring from this meeting, uh, you will answer them. And of course, Ms. Jenny Nacho, thank you very much. Now it is time to represent our uh, major lecture uh, representative. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Crispin Walking Lee, who is the head of healthcare planning at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. He is uh, responsible for healthcare planning and operation uh, commissioning on Great Oldman Street Hospital for Children NHS Trust. Mr. Crispin, are you here? I am. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hello. Hello. Thank you. So um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about how we at Great Ormond Street have approached our redevelopment um, and give you a little bit of context for that and explain some of the processes that we go through and some of the uh, uh, procurement decisions that we have made over the years. So if I could have the next slide, please. Just to start with a little bit of history of Great Ormond Street, it's already been mentioned that we are the oldest hosp uh, children's hospital in the UK. We opened on the 14th of February 1852. The hospital was in a Georgian house on Great Ormond Street um, and it had 10 beds and those beds were housed in the library of the Georgian house. Uh, our founder was a doctor, Charles West, um, who had three primary objectives when he founded the hospital. He wanted to provide dedicated healthcare facilities for children. He recognised that children's healthcare was not being uh, delivered effectively in adult hospitals. He wanted to carry out research into conditions of childhood um, to understand them better and to develop new treatments. And he wanted to train health professionals in the care and treatment of children specifically. So he uh, developed a training school for children's nurses and also for uh, a medical school for, for do uh, doctors specifically to work with children. We were the first children's hospital in the UK. And I think it's worth noting that although we are 168 years old, which is a, a rich history, um, it's worth noting that the oldest hospital in Britain is nearly 900 years old. And I think what that tells us is that the care of children was um, neglected for a very long time. 
for us to have had hospitals for over eight over 700 years before we had a dedicated children's hospital and over the years we've grown over those 168 years of our histories we have grown um, adopted new neighboring properties and built new facilities to meet the demand for our services. Uh, we've gone from 10 beds to around 400 beds on the site now. Um, uh, and if I can have the next slide, you'll see some quick facts. You've heard some of these. Um, one of the uh, notable things is how uh, the very specialised and highly specialised services that we have, although the majority of our children um, come from uh, the southeast of England, um, we uh, see children from um, all over the UK, and for some of those high, those some of those 17 highly specialised services, we might be the only place in the UK that treats that condition or provides that treatment. We have a lot of children who ha have undiagnosed conditions and we are a tertiary referral hospital. So we tend to see children after they have already been seen at a local uh, children's service um, uh, and uh, when their condition is, is too complicated for those local services to treat. We do a lot of research and we are attempting to um, become what we would want to be known as, as a research hospital rather than just a hospital that does research. And our ambition is that any child and family that want to participate in research have an opportunity to volunteer for a study. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is our site. And if you if I can just have a click please. I think you will see um, on the corner of, of the plan a flashing grey black box. Uh, the grey black box is the first, uh, is where the original children's hospital was in 1852 and the red zone is the area that we now occupy on that site. So you can see how we have grown in those 168 years. And if I can have one more click, um, the yellow boxes that appear will show you the other areas in the locality that we have now occupied, either by renting or buying additional buildings. So our primary site is that red block in the middle, but we um, occupy buildings uh, elsewhere as well. And our, our model has been to uh, develop a campus uh, um, uh, method of, uh, methodology whereby we we move as much as we can off that island site and keep that island site for um, our acute services. It's difficult and I'm going to come on to how difficult it is developing a modern children's hospital on a congested urban site. Uh, it's one of the key challenges of our redevelopment master plan. Uh, next slide please. Um, this is a plan view of our master plan. We have a redevelopment master plan which was agreed in 2015 and will be refreshed in 2021. Phases one, two and three are all complete um, and uh, the next phase of our redevelopment is going to be uh, the phase 4a building which we hope to start building in 2022 and complete in late 2025. Um, and then uh, we, we hope to build phase 4B after that. And phase 5, which you can see towards the top of the plan, is a building which uh, will probably be built in two phases. And we probably won't start building that until after 2030. So we have a far reaching vision of how we will ensure that we provide the best facilities for children and their families. Next slide, please. This slide just shows you uh, an overview of the phases of our master plan. The darker grey boxes towards the top are complete phases. Um, the Sight and Sound Centre is a really interesting project, it's a lovely project. Uh, we um, own um, the old Italian hospital which is about two minutes walk from the hospital um, and we have spent the last couple of years refurbishing that to a very high standard um, and completely uh, renovating it and it's going to be our dedicated site and sound centre. We think this is the first dedicated site and sound centre for children in the world. We have identified other centres that um, uh, focus on sight and other centres that focus on sound, but we think this is the first that has combined these two services into one building. It's a beautiful historic building which has been refurbished to a very high standard and will provide an excellent environment for these families that tend to come back to us for repeated appointments year after year from birth until they are up to eight. 
Phase 4A is the phase uh, on the frontage of our site, right on the street that we hope to start building in 2022. And Phase 4B and Phase 5 are uh, future phases that we don't have dates for yet. Next slide, please. Um, we have many drivers, many reasons for needing to undertake redevelopment. Um, many of our buildings are still quite old. One of the oldest buildings in which we still deliver clinical care is a 1930s building, which is unfit for, for purpose. So we continue to need to um, replace old uh, and uh, unfit buildings. Um, increasingly, the care that we provide is very specialised and high acuity. We have um, a very high acuity of our, our children. We have a lot of children in intensive care and we have a lot of children who require high dependency care. We have the need for a lot of new technologies to treat those children. So, for example, we have just um, completed um, an intraoperative MRI suite, which provides a facility where uh, children with epilepsy um, that have surgery surgery can be have surgery and then be immediately scanned um, so that um, we can prevent return return visits to theatre if possible. It's a facility that the Older Hay and Sheffield Children's Hospitals already had. So in this, ca in this case, uh, Great Ormond Street is playing catch up, but it's a facility that we ha now have and, and is, is open for business. And very soon we hope to have, uh, in the next couple of years, we hope to have a PET CT scanner, which will improve the offering for our uh, children with cancer. We need to improve clinical outcomes. We want to improve the life expectancy of children. We want to improve their lives and we want to uh, help those children to develop, to develop as fully as they can and to realise their full potential. We have a, a high ambition around uh, providing the best patient and family experience we can. One of the one of the interesting things about children's healthcare is that a child doesn't attend hospital on their own. Um, a child needs an adult with them, and so we need to care for that family as well. And the other thing that um, uh, uh, ill health in childhood and treatment of that ill health has a huge impact on family life, um, uh, damages relationships between parents and makes it very difficult for families to function effectively. So we want to provide the best facilities we can that family dynamics can be protected and continue during uh, a child's treatment and care. Um, we um, continue to, to need to grow to meet demand. So over the last 168 years, we have continued to grow because there has been greater demand for our services. And that demand continues to increase. Year on year, we see an increase in demand for our services, and we need to provide capacity to meet that demand. Um, we want to provide more, uh, more facilities for research. We want to make research um, uh, integrated into clinical care. So we, we need to provide facilities for that and for the staff that uh, run research studies. We want to make the estate more sustainable. We want to be a, a, a greener, more responsible site. Um, old buildings tend to be quite um, harmful to the environment, so we want to improve that uh, situation. And we want to be able to have better facilities management. A lot of people forget the sort of stuff that goes on in the bowels of a hospital, in the basement, all the logistical movements that happen for food, linen, waste, um, and those sort of operations, and they need to be integrated into our site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are a few options in the UK for procuring and funding hospitals. I'm just going to touch very quickly on this. Um, one of the uh, very popular um, funding options uh, in the past in the UK was public-private partnership. This has fallen out of favour now. Um, typically what would happen is um, private equity companies would provide the money to build the hospital. The contract would be administered by a special purpose vehicle on behalf of those investors. And the, the, the NHS trust, um, the hospital would repay the debt to that private equity company over a period of between 25 and 40 years. It's quite an expensive way to build hospitals, but it was seen as a way to identify a large sum of capital which you need to do the building work. Um, also, often these contracts would include um, services that ran for the whole of the concession period, for example, for hotel services and building maintenance. 
It was the primary methodology for building hospitals in the UK from 1990 till about 2015, um, but it has now fallen out of favour, as I say. If I could have the next slide. So traditional capital investment um, is the alternative which requires a substantial cash reserve or a gu guaranteed availability of capital. And that can come from one of a few sources. At Great Ormond Street, we're very fortunate that our capital comes primarily from charitable funds. We have a very active charity that raises money for us to undertake um, additional um, activities. They don't fund patient care, that's funded by the NHS, but we do um, uh, receive uh, substantial money from our charity for additional um, uh, activities, including our redevelopment. We can sometimes get government grants, but they have been difficult to get in the last five or six years, although money has been freed up from the centre again recently. And sometimes it can be possible to sell property or release equity to fund uh, 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 building works. But um, unfortunately, property sales rarely um, are as substantial as you want them to be to fund your, your redevelopment. If I could have the next slide. Um, we, we have a couple of options as well for how we manage contracts. Um, so um, we might talk about design and build contracts, which is the uh, bracket towards the top of this uh, diagram, where we uh, employ a contractor who will manage the design stages of the, of the project and will also manage the construction. Or alternatively, as you can see at the bottom, you can award separate contracts for the design. So you contract an architect directly to design your hospital, and then you, you tender that design to construction companies who will give you a price for building it, and then you go into contract with one of those companies to build your hospital. Um, what usually happens in that process is that the uh, design team will be novated to the construction company. So we'll report to the construction company and be paid by them from that point onwards. Um, and that can be interesting and sometimes challenging in terms of our relationships with the, um, with the design uh, team. If I could have the next slide. Um, we have chosen for the next phase of our redevelopment to do a design and build contract, but actually uh, we have um, awarded that contract through a contractor-led design competition. So what we did is we, we invited um, contractors to tender um, with design teams for a, uh, a project, uh, for this project. And the primary consideration in our, in our decision was the design concept. The contractor, however, is engaged from the outset of the project. So from the very beginning, we have some cost certainty um, uh, because the contractor is continually reviewing the buildability uh, and the cost implications of the design team's proposals. We have a works cost limit on this project and a target square meters, and that provides us with certainty and uh, uh, both ourselves and the contractor know uh, what the parameters of the project are from a very early stage. If I could have the next slide. Um, so our procurement strategy, um, uh, this slide shows how complicated uh, procuring a, a new hospital building is. And uh, the next slide shows us that although this methodology uh, is still complicated, it simplifies it uh, to a certain extent and uh, it, makes, um, it makes the process much more streamlined. Having the contractor that is going to build the building involved in the project from the very beginning to the very end um, is proving to be a successful formula for us. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about stakeholder engagement. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of stakeholder engagement. It's very important in the design process. Um, and uh, we have a young people's forum who are not dedicated to consulting with us about design uh, and uh, construction issues, but um, we do a lot of work with them to help us to develop our vision and our brief for new facilities. For each project, we also um, form expert patient groups with whom we do co-design work. So we sit down with them and we talk about our proposals and we talk about um, what we want to build and we look for their feedback on the design proposals. And we have many examples of when we have actually um, changed our methodology or way of thinking um, in response to what the young people themselves have told us. 
Also really important, of course, is consultation with clinicians and our, our, own, our own staff. They know best how they need to run their services. What they sometimes don't know, however, is how services will run and evolve in the future. So when, you, when we do this stakeholder engagement, we need to ensure that we are engaging with the right cross-section of staff that can tell us both how they function in the current department and the kind of uh, facilities they need to deliver care, but also those who have an insight into what care and treatments will be um, uh, happening in the future so that we can design a facility that will be a, a res responsive to those requirements. Um, we also have to do a lot of uh, stakeholder engagement with our local community. We sit in an area of London called Bloomsbury, which is uh, predominantly a residential area. The immediate locality of the hospital is predominantly residential. So um, uh, they uh, have a very large children's hospital on their doorstep uh, and we want to be good neighbours. So when you're building in a congested urban site, we consider it very important that we, we engage effectively with our neighbours. If I could have the next slide, please. So some of that stakeholder engagement has, has taught us some really important stuff about what we want to include in our buildings. And uh, just to highlight a few of these, um, our children and young people particularly um, tell us repeatedly how they want to have a connection with nature. We don't have very much nature in central London, we don't have a lot of uh, green space on our doorstep, so we need to try to exploit whatever opportunities we can to connect our young people with nature, to provide them with daylight and views. Acoustics are really important in that we need to create as peaceful an environment as we can. We all know that hospital environments are busy, noisy places, and unfortunately, when we are sick, we need peace and quiet and it, and hospital where we are treated is often the last place that we can find it. So we want to do a lot of work on acoustics and providing peaceful environments. Um, we incorporate art into all of our projects um, and we allow a 1% uh, 1 of the construction budget on all of our projects for art. And we engage with children and young people and staff in the selection of artworks and the commissioning of artworks. Um, and we, we uh, also recognise uh, the importance of technology and connectivity. Our children and young people particularly want to remain connected with their homes, with their schools, with their friends when they are separated from them in hospital. And we do a lot of work to try to ensure that that's possible. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, I want to talk a little bit about design brief and, and the purpose of the design brief. So a design brief is what we issue to the contractor uh, or the design team at the outset of the project. The brief describes our vision and the values of the organisation. It provides a narrative that will inform the design team about what makes our organisation special, what it is about us that um, they need to consider. It will also detail the functional content, the actual um, um, facilities that they need to provide, the specification of those facilities. We can also use this as an opportunity to articulate design standards and what uh, uh, guidance needs to be complied with. And we can also provide detailed schedules of accommodation, including the size that we expect rooms to be and what facilities those rooms need to include. If I could have the next slide. We see um, design briefs as having three parts to them, content, context, and concept. The next slide, please. The context of a design brief is about the strategy and culture of the organization. It provides background about our, our history, about our location, what constraints may exist in terms of town planning, our place in the local community, how this project that we are briefing we are feeds into the master plan of for the organization for our site and our vision for key um, uh, facets um, of our of our uh, philosophy around sustainability our research model education and ict so this is a very broad context that gives a lot of background next slide please the concept is around um, the the key features that we want to include and the, the, the our patient stories. So our, our design briefs include a lot of detail about 
the experience of being in hospital for our children and families, what hospitals are like to work in, what engagement activities we've undertaken and how those have um, fed into our vision and our brief, um, and information about how we want certain things to be done. So these are, this, these are very conceptual uh, factors. And the next slide. And the final uh, facet is content. Um, this is a very functional part of the brief. So we talk about functional content. We talk about how we think the building should be stacked, what our demand and capacity modeling has shown us about how, the, how big the building should be, how many beds we need, how many consulting rooms we need, what key functions we need, what imaging equipment we need, how many theatres, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and how we think that those departments should be um, positioned so that they're adjacent uh, to the critical other functions. Next slide, please. Um, these are just a few to conclude just a few of the design aspirations that we have developed over um, the last few years. Um, we try to put as much plant below ground as possible. Some plant always has to go at roof level, but we try to put as much down below the ground as possible so that we can reserve the top floors of the building for clinical space, particularly wards. We try to push wards to the top of the building so that they have the best light and the best views. We want to try to separate flows, so we want to try to keep the facilities management movements separate from patient movements and from public flows so that families and children don't see all of those things that happen below ground that they don't need to see. We want to try to improve links between buildings. This is a particular issue around our site where we've developed over 125 years and tacked building onto building onto building. And we want to try to consolidate and co-locate clinical functions so the hospital works more effectively. We need to provide peaceful places for staff to rest and recharge. And we want social spaces for those families that are resident with their, with their children so that they have a place to retreat to. Um, and one of the key, uh, key cornerstones of our design philosophy now is to reserve the rooftop as much as possible for gardens so that we have open spaces to which children and families can go and staff can go for uh, that connection with nature and a bit of fresh air and space at the end of the day or during the day. Thank you very much. My last slide is just to thank you. I'm sorry that I've overshot by a few minutes uh, and uh, thank you for listening and I hope that that has been helpful. Thank you, Crispin. We uh, really much appreciate that uh, we are having you here, and I believe that you share with us a quite uh, interesting and useful information. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Ms. Angie May, who is the International Partnership Lead in the Department of International Child Health uh, uh, in Alderley Hay Hospital in Liverpool. Angie has worked in NHS for 30 years and uh, has significant experience in a professional nursing leadership roles. I can wait to hear more about uh, uh, you from your uh, Miss Meg. Hi. 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 Lovely to um, be here. Looking forward to um, sharing some more information about Older Hay and then hearing how we can potentially support each other as well, really. Um, so if we get on with the presentation so that we can catch up with the questions and things. Um, thank you for inviting Older Hay to be part of this webinar. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. I'd like um, to welcome you to virtually to Older Hay. We've been providing healthcare not quite as long as Great Ormond Street is, but it is for over 100 years. Um, we're based in Liverpool, which is up in the northwest of the country. And we work across local, regional, national and international geographies. We are one of the largest paediatric hospitals in Western Europe, and we have the UK's largest paediatric emergency department. And we're a designated children's major trauma centre. We now have a purpose-built research institute and the UK's only NHS innovation hub. This helps us to ensure that um, children and young people mm -hmm. are able to benefit from the very latest in research and innovation. I hope um, this presentation will help you to provide you with an insight about how we do things at Older Hay, including our recent hospital construction, our use of digital technology, and how we work with partners to ensure sustainability. And I would like to start by showing you a brief video. Have the next slide, please. And if we can just play the video.
just uh, if you click onto the picture, there'll be an arrow um, and you can just press that and that'll start to play. Play again. There we go. We all start from the same place. Childhood is the foundation on which lives are built. Children's early health and well-being plays a critical role in shaping their future selves. Every child is unique and the way that we care for our children and young people must recognise their individual needs. At Alder Hay, this is what drives us. For more than a century, we've been pioneers in children's health. Our team are experts in their field, leading the way in national and international paediatric health care. Alder Hay is a world-leading children's hospital, but we are much more than that. We provide care and support that wraps around our patients and their families, looking after the physical and mental health and well-being of children and young people and the emotional well-being of their families, whether on our health campus, with our partners, or in patients' homes and communities, because every child should have the chance to reach their potential. We're a trailblazer for research, education, and innovation, leading the way in finding new treatments which are changing the face of paediatric medicine and building a healthier future, not just for our patients, but for children across the world. But we aren't doing this on our own. We've brought together on-site clinicians, academic institutions, and industry partners to tackle the big problems facing children. We're the highest enroller of children and young people into clinical research in the UK. At our purpose-built clinical research facility, we collaborate with partners to develop better, safer medicines for children. We're a world leader in digital health and innovation. In our innovation hub, we work with visionary inventors, entrepreneurs, and global technology companies to nurture new ideas and test out the latest developments, like using artificial intelligence and predictive analytics that help us provide better care to patients by detecting potential and emerging problems, advanced sensors which prevent the need for needles, and virtual reality and 3D printing to simulate complex surgeries outside of the operating theatre. Because together, we are stronger. We dream bigger. We achieve more. And as our partnerships constantly push the boundaries of what we can do, at the Alder Hay Academy, we're training the next generation of clinical leaders who will use these new developments to transform lives. We're sharing our learnings and expertise with colleagues around the globe so that children everywhere can benefit from our expertise. To a child, nothing is impossible. And because children inspire everything we do, our ambition to give young people across the world the best possible life knows no limits. Thank you. The next slide, please. Our 3,800 staff, plus 1,000 medical nursing and allied health professional students, care for over 270,000 children and young people each year. We provide this care across 60 specialties from a range of settings, including our world-leading Alder Hay in the Park campus and our widespread and diverse community sites. We're nationally commissioned as one of four epilepsy surgery centres in partnership with Manchester Children's Hospital and one of four commissioned paediatric national facial, uh, craniofacial units. We're also a regional cardiac surgical centre providing a seamless pathway of care for children with congenital heart problems. Next slide, please. After 100 years, our hospital buildings were struggling to keep up with the demands of modern healthcare, and it was time to create a better environment for our patients and staff. As Crispin said, being in a city, it isn't easy to find land for development, but we were located next to a public park. However, it's extremely difficult to get planning permission to build on a park. So um, we undertook a public consultation and worked with local and national government to gain permission to progress the project as a land swap agreement. This took a few years, as Crispin said before, it's quite a complicated process to go through and we underwent several government assessments and approvals. Once it was agreed we could progress, we worked with children and ran a competition for children to draw their dream hospital. 
that's the flower picture there that is the winner. Um, and that informed the design team and our children and young pa people's patient forum were involved at every step of the project. And it's fair to say they provided innovative and challenging suggestions. Uh, interestingly, actually, one of the children that took part in this process is now training to be an architect. The design team worked with our clinical teams and a change programme was undertaken to review patient pathways and consider new ways of working so that we weren't just continuing to do what we, things the way we always have. We were looking at how the, heat, the hospital would prepare for future needs and had capacity to expand. We um, worked with the Prince's Foundation and the National Arts for Health within the design process and recruited an artist as an advisor. We worked with a range of partners to develop environmentally sustainable solutions, and you'll see them there on the slide on the bottom right. Um, and our design brief was very clear. If we've seen it before, it's the wrong solution. We contracted with John Lang, Lang O'Rourke and InterServe to complete the building refurb and, and furnishing of the hospital. And the new hospital covers a floor area, of, which you'll see in the bottom left, um, a 51,000 square metre floor area. We have 270 beds, including 48 critical care beds. And our six wards have 75% of rooms as single occupancy with ensuite facilities. Each ward has an outdoor play deck and every inpatient room has a view to the outside environment connecting with nature and promoting well-being. We strove at the time of this improvement process as well to increase our day, um, day surgery capacity. So we have 12 main theatres and four day case um, theatres. The building has been received extremely well and we've won 22 awards um, for the build and other aspects. And it was actually voted by the BBC's People's Choice Award uh, building of the decade 2018. Next slide, please. One of the things mentioned in the brief was about the management and sustainability of the hospital. Um, so just to give a brief overview, all hospitals within the UK are regulated by the Care Quality Commission. There are a range of national clinical and operational policies and guidelines from organisations such as the Department of Health, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and a wide range of professional bodies and royal colleges. All of these inform the way we work at Older Hay, but our main priority, as seen here in our strategic plan on a page, is a healthier future for children and young people. Our strategic aims, doing the basics brilliantly and growing the future, are underpinned by the trust values of respect, excellence, innovation, working together and openness. Next slide, please. Our two main strategic aims are interdependent and are woven into each of our strategic objectives, as throughout all of the underpinning plans, programmes and projects that we undertake. Brilliant basics are the foundation on which high quality services are built. And our primary objectives are to deliver outstanding care and have the best people doing their best work. And this foundation of brilliant basics is needed in order for us to grow our future. And growing the future means that we'll make the most of our opportunities to achieve sustainability through partnership and game-changing research and innovation. And we must grow the future in order to, to sustain our brilliant basics. Next slide, please. We believe that delivering outstanding care goes hand in hand with enabling the best people to do their best work. So some of our excesses shown here are achieved through a devolved risk model. Our services are clinically led through clinical divisions that are responsible and accountable for the overall clinical workforce and financial performance of their area. Each division is led by a leadership team that comprises of a clinical director, a senior manager and an associate chief nurse who work together with their service leads and managers. These divisions are supported by professional departments in corporate and support services that deliver, for example, our ambitious digital infrastructure, financial rigor, and an overarching communications and engagement plan. We have a number of, of programs um, of work such as inspiring quality and this helps us to support our teams to constantly improve and our project de delivery management office provide program management and support to make sure that we're on track for all that we want to do we also operate a, a ward to board assurance um, model and this includes something called safe together and always right which is our ward accreditation scheme this is supported by Perfect Ward, which is an app-based uh, real-time inspection and reporting tool. This saves a lot of time on administration because we capture inspection results 
directly onto electronic devices, and it provides automated reporting. Next slide, please. In terms of growing our future, innovation is recognised as a sustainable business within the Trust. We've been able to secure funding and meet its financial goals through pledges from charity, grants and co-creation partners. Our rapid prototype centre enables faster and easier development of innovative technologies for child health. And it supports the divisions with rapid problem solving. This was particularly highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Through technical scouting and engagement with external partners, the trust rapidly solved on the ground problems. Some of the solutions included the rapid prototyping and sourcing of alternative PPE in terms of visors, gowns and masks, and developing something called the distancer, a contactless door opener. The team developed a digital assistant or a chatbot called Sally, which stands for staff advice and link information. And this helped answer questions from our staff and provided them with access to key information during the pandemic. Before this, we'd also developed the older, hey, the older play app that can be downloaded on smartphones to familiarize children and young people and their families with older hay and provides a distraction tool and a game-based reward system to promote compliance with diagnostic tests and other aspects of their care pathway. In March, the innovation department ran an artificial intelligence competition with one of its first projects, Asthma Mapping, uh, winning the Northwest Coast Research and Innovation Award. The project um, involved working with multiple agencies and analysing a variety of data from different sources to develop a monthly heat map that depicts locations with high paediatric asthma morbidity and related contributing factors. This includes wider determinants of health care of health that are driven by socioeconomic deprivation and our unique analytical technique provides us with the opportunity to identify and implement the most appropriate interventions to tackle child respiratory inequalities. And we are currently working in partnership with Microsoft using the HoloLens 2 and Insight to further develop our immersive healthcare capacity. Next slide, please. Innovation works very closely with the digital department as well. We have an ethos of outstanding digital excellence and have completed the Global Digital Exemplar Programme and gained a high level of accreditation for our healthcare information and management systems confirming Older Hay as one of the most digitally mature trusts in the country. And when the coronavirus hit, um, telehealth became essential to support accurate remote clinical decision making now that the movement of staff between hospitals needed to be limited and patients' attendance to clinic needed to be reduced. We implemented video consult consultations using the Attend Anywhere digital platform so that where appropriate, patients and families could connect through an online portal using their smartphones or computers. We've recently won the best COVID-19 telecommunication solution in partnership with InTouch Health for the use of telemedicine robots. The robots were funded by Old Hayes Children's Charity and enabled clinicians to take part in virtual ward rounds, deliver ad hoc emergency medical advice and facilitate urgent reviews for patients even without having to be there in person. And the robots have two incredibly high definition cameras which provide a clear view for the, for the clinicians. And they have technology where the stethoscopes and scanners can be plugged in so that the clinician who could be at home or working from another site is able to make much more accurate clinical decisions. Next slide, please. In terms of research, we've been at the forefront for children's health research for, and leading the way for drug safety. And we host the Clinical Research Network for Children. We maintain our position as uh, the highest recruiting centre for studies in children with 8,400 babies and children and young people being entered into clinical research studies last year. And one of our studies, the dynamic electronic tracking and escalation to reduce clinical critical care transfers, the DETECT study is much easier to say, um, reported a significant reduction in the number of critical care beds. Uh, this is beneficial not only to patient safety, but also had a forecast of potential savings of 4 million per year. Next slide, please. We also have our academy. Our vision is to be the destination for education and training in specialist and general paediatric healthcare, delivering world renowned inspirational and specialist training to all healthcare professionals. The academy can offer a range of education and learning programmes, and we can work with individual organisations to develop bespoke programmes. Working like this actually led to us join, being joint winners of um, a, an award for doing business in China as well. Next slide, please. 
that's just a, a, a display really of all our partners. I think throughout the presentation, hopefully you can see how working in partnership is embedded in, in all of the work that we do within Older Hay, from our local education institutions to more technical organisations as well. And at the moment, we're also working with our Liverpool partners to bid for Liverpool to become one of the UNICEF's child-friendly cities and provide a healthy future for children and families across Liverpool. Next slide, please. This is all supported by our charity, um, raising five million pounds last year and our volunteer programme delivering 25,000 hours of volunteering. And if we could play the video in the last slide, please. Part of the agreement for us to build on the park is the development space left for the demolition of the old hospital and the permanent public space. We are now developing the health campus in the park, showing how children and young people can be truly at the heart of their own health care and treatment. The campus represents a shared vision of a focus on children and young people. And So I'm not sure how much you heard there, but it's that uh, the campus represents a shared vision with a focus on children and young people's health in a green space. It's a vision that's been dictated by children and it will be a beacon of excellence for learning and best practice for Liverpool, and of which everyone can be proud. Our health campus is made up of our world-class hospital, the Research and Innovation Institute, including the Academy, the Older Centre Bereavement and Counselling Service and Community Neurodevelopmental and Mental Health Service buildings. We're also building a new neonatal unit as part of the Liverpool Neonatal Partnership. The enhanced Springfield Park will be returned to the community in 2023 and will include a community police hub, therapeutic gardens and provide a green space where children and young people can play that supports the wider well-being of the local community. And the last slide please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miss May. Uh, quite impressive as a chairwoman of health and life science cluster, a person that is dealing with uh, innovation. I am quite impressed of uh, the how your hospital actually adopt uh, so much innovation. You mentioned artificial intelligence, VR. It's really impressive, and I hope that uh, the good know-how will be transposed into Bulgaria also. And uh, I uh, can't. Uh, uh, do not uh, uh, repeat uh, the, the, the slogan from one of the, your video, dream bigger, achieve more, indeed. Thank you very much. And now um, I want to give a stage for Mr. Don Chubarbov, who is the Deputy Major uh, for Finance and Healthcare at Sofia Municipality. Mr. Barbov, are you here? Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, of course, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning from me as well. Uh, first, I want to congratulate the organizers and in particular the uh, British Embassy for taking the lead of uh, having us together. I think this is a very uh, important and productive meeting. And I will use my uh, few minutes to share the experience which we have and what we are doing to uh, work more in providing better health care for uh, children. Uh, as uh, we are a municipality, uh, and, uh, we have uh, some uh, municipal hospitals in, in Sofia. Approximately one third of the healthcare services in Sofia are, are provided by our health institutions. Uh, we are focusing mainly on uh, um, primary health care. Of course, we have some hospitals, some of them are specialized. And uh, before doing uh, more investments and more uh, uh, activities in healthcare. We looked into the uh, healthcare facilities in Sofia and how, how they are organized. And uh, in fact, we have uh, 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 children um, uh, units, children departments in many of the hospitals in, in Sofia, including uh, ours and, uh, of course, in some government and some privately owned hospitals. But what is usually very difficult is uh, for, for the parents to find the best place where they can go uh, because um, these hospitals are usually specialized in certain uh, diseases and it's not always uh, for the parents to, to better understand where to go. 
So what we are trying to do is we are working on creating a one entry point where, uh, they, where parents can go with their children, where they can receive some outpatient, uh, some out hospital um, health services uh, by, by specialists. And if necessary, they can be referred to a specialized hospital uh, based on uh, the findings uh, of uh, the particular needs. Uh, also, uh, what we are doing is we are uh, going to have uh, our um, health institution uh, designed for children because usually hospitals are not designed for children, they're designed for uh, adults. And uh, we want to have something which is more uh, children friendly, bright colors, uh, some environment which is not going to look like a hospital. Uh, what we are benefiting is that next to our building, we have a, a garden. So we are going to have a small uh, children playground there. So if they come uh, with uh, their brother sisters, they can uh, go and uh, wait uh, um, for them outside. And uh, what is also uh, very important is, and this is positive, is that we are now in process of tendering the construction works. We hope that next year we're going to, to complete the construction and open our facility. Uh, we are going to use an existing building, of course, upgraded to, to modern standards. So the contract is going to be designed and built uh, because uh, is shared by, by uh, some of our British uh, friends. Um, doing separately design and build uh, sometimes take time and uh, uh, the result is not always what you can expect. Of course, uh, to have uh, a nice building, we are going to use Bulgarian young designers for the external outlook of uh, this facility. And we hope to have something very modern from outside and very, uh, I would say traditional in a positive sense from inside. And uh, our goal is to provide uh, one entry point where children can uh, start their uh, health treatment in Sofia. So thank you for the uh, attention. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pavlov. Actually, um, I'm very happy you to be here. Uh, Sofia is well known as one of the most greenest uh, capital in the world. Actually, we have a lot of parks to mountains. So I believe that uh, the, this is a perfect place where we can position such a hospital in a way that the children can uh, use the environmental and all these good practices that our colleagues mentioned. Thank you very much for our online audience. I want to invite you to ask your question and share opinion over our topics of discussion. We will open the second part of um, our webinar, the discussion panel, with uh, a special guest. Um, this is uh, Mr. Martin Shideruf, who is the head of healthcare and life science investment services team in, at, at the Ernest and Young in London. He will share with us something very uh, interesting uh, for us. Uh, it is connected with the experience from UK, how the hospital can be actually an asset for the state, for the business, and how they support the, the innovation. Martin, are you here? Can you hear us? Hi. Yes, yes. Hi. Hi, Christina. Can you hear me? Sure, sure. Please yeah, continue. Great. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for uh, organizing this event uh, and thank you to Andrew and Crispin for these great and uh, very inspirational presentations. Um, so what I wanted to kind of share is a bit of a kind of a, my perspective um, here in the UK. Um, so I obviously work very closely with the, um, as part of my job, I work very closely with the British government, um, with the uh, Department for International Trades, which focuses on attracting foreign uh, innovation into the UK, into the healthcare and life sciences um, ecosystem. Um, so basically, one of the key questions that we get from companies is how they can work with the NHS, uh, because they uh, see the NHS as a clear, um, clear asset and clear opportunity. Um, so obviously, the NHS is the, the biggest uh, unified healthcare system in the world. 
uh, access to 65 million um, you know population and patients so there is a great um, great market there um, but it's not only the scale of the market it's the um, the uh, the intent of the NHS and we heard a bit from Angie in terms of what older hay is doing in terms of attracting innovation uh, but there is very clear clinical and commercial intent uh, so in terms of the clinical intent uh, obviously the NHS would like to attract uh, only the best products and innovation for the benefits of the patients um, so they work very very closely with business uh, in in industries within healthcare and life sciences. Um, and there is a commercial side to that as well. Um, so it's not only the, the best innovation, but the innovation which makes sense commercially, which improves, uh, which adds efficiency, and it's also cost effective. Um, so the um, so the NHA is very much open to working with with uh, with uh, with businesses across healthcare, medical devices, digital health, uh, AI. Uh, but this doesn't happen uh, in isolation. Um, there are different organizations which kind of encompass this intent, um, uh, like uh, the NIHR, which is uh, essentially the research arm of the NHS. Uh, so this is one kind of a stop shop and one kind of a portal for all clinical uh, research. Uh, which can be conducted within the NHS infrastructure uh, and which could be um, which uh, commercial partners and industry partners could engage with. Uh, so every year the NIHR um, supports um, over 1,500 industry-led uh, commercial studies within the NHS infrastructure. Uh, so it's a very easy kind of access to, to the NHS assets. So that's hospitals, that's clinicians, that's medical professionals and healthcare professionals. Uh, so they help you with kind of, you know, shaping your, your study, um, assessing the feasibility, doing pilots in clinical research to validate your new innovation and later on uh, introduce it to the NHS. Um, so there are other organizations which promote that, particularly on the academic um, side of things. So there are um, uh, networks called the Academic Health Science Networks. So they very closely work to promote uh, innovation coming from academia into the NHS, into the, into the hospitals. Um, so again, this doesn't happen in isolation. It's all very much promoted by, by the government. So the government has uh, introduced a, a kind of fairly new um, sort of life sciences industrial strategy, uh, which talks about um, promoting the NHS as a clear asset, not only in the UK, but internationally, promoting clinical research, uh, promoting innovation. Um, and um, the other thing which was mentioned, uh, I think by Crispin around the kind of the, the recruitment of, of patients. So the uh, in the UK is, is possibly one of the most active um, a kind of a, a patient research population. So people are very keen to get involved and, and support as much as they can. Uh, and that very much kind of comes as a, as a result of the great work which charities do. So individual charities which are associated with hospitals, uh, but there are some big charities like the Cancer Research UK, which is possibly one of the biggest in the world, uh, which certainly engage with patients and certainly encourage them to participate in trials uh, to further promote and accelerate innovation. Um, so that's kind of a quick run through for me. Um, I don't know, Christina, do you have any, anything else that you want me to add? Or? Uh, thank you, Paul. There will be some questions, but yeah, very impressive. Uh, and uh, we're taking uh, our roles. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to, to see that uh, here we're having actually a representative uh, from our government. I hope that they will take a note uh, over your uh, short overview. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, now uh, the real part of the discussion will come. Everyone uh, from our panelists will have a chance to share his opinion over the topic of discussion, to ask a question to our honorable uh, keystone speakers, uh, unfortunately, we have been only five minutes uh, per panelist, but uh, we are we having a tight time uh, and uh, I'm sure this is only the first one of the meeting. So uh, it is great and I'm very happy that in this uh, studio, I'm not alone uh, next to me, as uh, you all see during all the time. I'm supported by Professor Vladimir uh, Piusov, who is the chairman of the Board of Pediat Bulgarian Pediatric Association. Hi, Dr. Piosov. It's great to, to having you here. Uh, I know that you are well prepared in all <laughs> topics actually that we have. So, yeah, good day to all. Uh, yeah. 
thank you for the fantastic role for fantastic presentation. But I continue in Bulgaria. Oh, okay, sure. Switch in Bulgaria. Okay. Първо се обръщам към Кристин от Грей Търман Стрит. Той може би не знае... I'm sorry, can you be more louder? Да. Той може би не знае, че в България сме свързани, поне някои институции, с Грей Търман Стрит. В далечната 1997 година в нашата болница, а това е болницата, национална кардиологична болница, в която аз работя в София, в продължение на десетина години, всяка година идваше хирурга, сърдечният хирург Мартин Елият, който дълги години е работил именно в Гритор Монстрит. И нашата детска сърдечна хирургия, включително и доктор Пламен Митес, който ще участва, имат тесни връзки с тази болница. Така че първо благодаря на Гил Торман Трид. Второ, разбрахме от всички презентации до тук, че в Великобритания има около 34-35 детски болници. Простата сметка показва, че на около 2 милиона население има една болница. Ако се запитаме колко болници има в България за деца на 2 милиона население, се оказва, че няма нито една. Говоря за голяма болница, в която всички специалисти са обединени под един покрит. Беше представена философията как се планира детска болница. Изключително важно нещо. И тук се обръщам така към българската аудитория, че да, важен е какъв е бетона, но не само това. И не бих казал, че това е най-важно. Най-важното е болницата да се направи такава, че да отговаря на детската душа. Ако това е възможно, а трябва да е възможно, защото околността, атмосферата, начина по който са устроени всяко отделно помещение, имат пряко отношение към лечебния процес, колкото и това може би да изглежда не съвсем логично за някои. Така че това, което се каза от колегите от Англия е изключително важна, защото те посочиха пътя и философията, по която трябва да се върви за изграждането на една детска болница, включително и за устройство на детското здравеопадване. Тано повече хора чуят това. Благодаря. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pirosov. Our next participant is Professor Ivan Ivanov. He is the head of clinic in Medical University of Plovdiv and St. George University Hospital. Professor Ivanov, are you online? Can you hear us? Hi. Can you please unmute my colleagues to appoint me that you are muted right now? Hi, Professor Ivanov. Yeah, hello, colleagues. I'm here. Hi. I want to share the screen. Is it possible? Technically? Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. My colleague appoint me that is possible. So please share your screen. Sorry, sorry. There's supposed to be a green button showing mm. in the middle of the screen. Uh, I don't see the slides exactly. Uh, so, so. Okay. Uh, just, just a moment, please. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Uh, anyway, just to uh, no, not not lose the time, uh, not to waste time. Uh, I am part of the biggest hospital in Bulgaria. This is uh, uh, the, the the Saint George the Saint George University Hospital, and uh, 
Apart, okay. Uh, part of this hospital, we, we have a, a, a department that is uh, with 100 beds. It is a department that is, uh, uh, okay, I lost it. I don't know where, where I can find it anyway. Sorry, sorry for that. If you want, you can send the presentation via email to my colleagues that sent you the link and uh, they will... Uh, maybe, 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 maybe if we can do it some other time, because time and time is important now. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's uh, leave, 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 the, leave, leave the presentation. Okay, so uh, we have... The hospital that is about 50 years old, it is not 180 years old, uh, but we have some traditions and we maintain uh, the, the best standards we can afford in Bulgaria. Uh, we treat uh, all types of uh, diseases because, in fact, we are the only department with uh, uh, specialists uh, from uh, all subspecialists in one unit, in one, in one department, which is a great benefit because we don't have any financial or logistic problems, unlike other, unlike other departments in, uh, in the country or elsewhere. Uh, our major issue is uh, that the building is rather old and uh, we made, uh, uh, we organized a donation campaign two years ago, uh, which was uh, rather impressive, at least for the city of Plodiv and the surroundings. And uh, finally, uh, our government uh, supplied us with uh, the necessary uh, amount of uh, finance in order to build a new clinic, which is a very good uh, news for us. But something inspiring. We're now in the process of uh, building, well, that was making the projects. We had the brief already that was already uh, given by uh, Mr. Crispin Walking Lee. So the brief hour is already done. We had the project on a architectural phase, uh, but the technological phase is uh, not done any, uh, at the moment. So I think this is the time to make a good audit of our architecture and to see what is missed. Uh, the thing that uh, really annoyed me is that uh, uh, if we see what is missed, it is already something that is wrong because uh, the, the suggestion was to think that is something that is not seen anywhere. So that's a really difficult problem uh, to solve, but then perhaps an audit with uh, uh, some of the uh, lectures we had already from Gosh and from Liverpool, I think it will be uh, very timely and uh, it, 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 it will be a benefit of our project. Uh, a second uh, field of uh, communication and improvement of our healthcare is uh, audit of our algor uh, algorithms. In the last uh, three years, uh, we uh, designed and uh, agreed upon uh, algorithms of, uh, of uh, treatment of about 40 emergency situations or common situations that we have in our clinic. Uh, but this is a field that is uh, in, uh, improved uh, every day. Nothing is settled and an audit of these algorithms that it will be quite helpful for improvement of our healthcare. Otherwise, uh, we are in a pretty good shape in terms of stuff. Of course, nurses are missing, but that's all over the world. And we are trying to manage this problem uh, to the best uh, of our possibilities. Uh, finance is always missing, but it's, uh, we, we also manage to do to this problem. And we thank to the hospital management, which is really uh, rather impressive. Uh, so in these two fields, I hope we will we'll make uh, some collaboration, architecture uh, and technology and uh, auditor algorithms. Sorry, it's been out of the world. Okay, so that's for me. Thank you for uh, the attention. And uh, thank you for the British Bulgarian Business Association and the embassy for organizing this meeting. I think it's great and we took some ideas. So uh, this is helpful and this increases our knowledge in the terms of uh, business planning and architecture planning, not only for medicine, because first we're medical doctors, but we, now we have to be a bit more uh, in terms of education and uh, management. Sure. So,
Thank you, and I hope that we have all the good uh, know-how and to find the more way how the innovative companies will uh, bring more innovation into the hospital. You will point uh, several good examples with artificial intelligence. I am sure that uh, we will establish more long-term relationship. Okay, our next participant is Ms. Asia Paskalev. Uh, she is the Executive Director of Bulgarian Center of Bioethics. Asia, are you here? Asia? Probably the colleagues to check if there is. She is not here, unfortunately, probably some technical issues. We will continue with Associated Professor Dr. Emil Slavov. Dr. Slavov, are you here? Dr. Slavov? Yes. Ah, hi. Hi, 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 it's a pleasure for me to, to be a participant of this uh, very interesting uh, if I if I did, may did, did you hear me? Yes, if I may only to uh, represent you in a very few sentence. Uh, Associated Professor Dr. Emil Swap is the Vice Director for the project activities at the Trakia University in Stara Zagora, and he's Associated Professor of Immunopathology and Allergology in the Department of Molecular Biology. Hi, uh, Emil, it is great to, to, to speak with you. Please share with us your thought about um, how we can uh, exchange more good practices and implement into Bulgaria, hopefully. The child uh, health is one very interesting and very uh, serious problem uh, because uh, the, um, the early stage is very sensitive uh, from many diseases. And that's why uh, we are obliged to uh, perform one very good, uh, very well uh, arranged uh, uh, medical uh, practice and medical activities uh, for uh, um, to look well for the children's health. Mm, uh, what I could say for the situation in uh, Stara Zagora, um, there is two uh, department of uh, pediatrics, so one in the uh, university hospital and uh, one other in uh, one uh, private hospital. And there is uh, some uh, special, uh, specialized of uh, different uh, medical specialities, but uh, not uh, all of them. And uh, this is one of the problems uh, of our organization and I uh, agree with uh, all other speakers that said that there is a uh, need uh, to talk and to discuss, uh, discuss about the need to, um, to be created uh, more than one hospital clinic uh, and more than one hospital in uh, Bulgaria. And I would like to point uh, on one other uh, question that is very interesting in, and very important, uh, important for the early child uh, ages. And this is uh, the problem uh, related uh, with uh, the um, immunodeficiencies. Uh, this is one of the problems that stay a little bit uh, outside of the main topics related to uh, with uh, the main specialities like cardiology, pulmonology, and some other uh, um, departments that are with the main importance. But you know that the immune health is very important, and that's why we need to think about this and uh, to make some uh, steps to, to perform some uh, better practice related with earlier detection of uh, immune deficiencies. Uh, that is very important because um, in some cases, uh, the diagnosis related with immune deficiencies uh, appear uh, um, two, three, or many years after the start of the disease. And this is a very, very important problem. Uh, that's why we need to talk uh, with this problem uh, in parallel with the um, 
state uh, idea uh, how to to build uh, more uh, maybe two or three pediatric children's clinic in Bulgaria. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Swap, it was quite uh, interesting. Um, I can share with uh, our audience that actually Health and Life Science Cluster Bulgaria having already a, a partnership memorandum with Track uh, University in order to find a way how to collaborate more strictly those uh, golden triangle between the business academia and of course the hospital. And I hope uh, soon or the, on the next edition we will share more information and the good news from Bulgaria also. So our next participant is Dr. Puaman Mitev. He is a pediatric surgeon, manager of Health Hospital and Children Health Mental Center in Sofia. Actually, Dr. Mitev is quite interested. He having a great know-how by working here and in UK. So I expecting uh, from him to share more how to collaborate more tightly, or probably what kind of a uh, best practices we can uh, implement into Bulgaria healthcare. Hi, Dr. Mitev. Can you hear me? Dr. Mitev? Polix? Is Dr. Mitev online? I, yes. Dr. Mitev, can you hear me? Hi. Probably some technical issues. I know that he's online, but Uh, he's, uh, Dr. Mitev, can you please unmute yourself? Dr. Mitev? Dr. Mitev? Okay, we will continue and then we'll back to Dr. Mitev again. Probably he having some technical issues with the mic, but uh, we will continue, of course, with the program and then we'll, at the end, we will try again to connect with Dr. Mitev. Uh, our next participant is Dr. Dimitar Gilgiev, who is the founder of Bulgarian Association of a Personalized uh, Medicine. I'm very eager to understand more how actually the, the hospitals uh, collaborate. Uh, with the patient organization. I heard that there is a good know-how from the colleagues from UK, but probably uh, Dr. Dimitar Georgiev will share more. Hi, Dimitar, can you? Hi, Hi Christina. Thanks. Thank you Thank you for inviting me for this um, amazing event. In fact, I have to thank you personally for organizing it because without your energy and enthusiasm, this would never be possible. Um, I have followed very carefully the presentations of the colleagues from the United Kingdom. And the first thing which I have to say is that uh, I am extremely sad about Brexit because uh, when you go out of the EU, we will lose you as good partners in a way, but hopefully we will keep the ties. I have been twice to the Great Ormond Hospital, not as a patient, but as a part of a delegation. And this is amazing hospital indeed. And uh, it was an honor for me to be there. So. The second point is that um, uh, I have seen how big the divide is within Europe between East and West. Uh, it is also big within uh, South and North, but between East and West, the divide is high. Uh, and I hope that this will not continue further because um, actually this uh, divide and this uh, difference uh, uh, reflects at the end of the children's health. Um, uh, yes, uh, the role of patient organizations is uh, extremely important in modern healthcare, and uh, modern healthcare practically cannot exist without the involvement of the patients. This is what we do actually partially in the Bulgarian Society for Personalized Medicine, where we are actively uh, using the inclusion of the patients in uh, implemented in the healthcare. Uh, some others are uh, in our pipeline, if I can say so. So uh, it was extremely informative for me and very useful. And I hope that uh, this will not be the last meeting of its kind. Thank you, Christina. Thank you all. As, uh, as usual, quite useful information. Uh, thank you very much. Our next participant is Professor Dr. Violeta Yotuba. She is the, uh, from the Department of the Director of um, Medical University in Varna. Dr. Uh, Yotuba, can you, Professor Yotuba, can you hear us? Hi. Yes, I hear you. I hope that you hear me too. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. 
First of all, let me thank uh, our British uh, guest and uh, his embassy for uh, this uh, uh, kind outreach to our needs. Uh, and uh, I am sure that Brexit would uh, not affect our ties because they are so uh, uh, ancient. I had a, a possibility to experience this as a fellow in UK when I personally had uh, health problems and uh, I can assure everyone that uh, Bulgarians are well accepted in uh, healthcare everywhere and also our patients that we have to send outside. Uh, our service is the third biggest in Bulgaria and we annually help more than 5,500 children. And uh, as uh, Professor Ivanov said, we are situated within uh, a large hospital, multi-profile hospital. The difference uh, being that uh, it's one building. So everything is within one building in our hospital. Uh, I has, have to say that we are extremely well accepted by adult colleagues, but still there is unmet need for the children uh, and uh, their specific needs. Um, I also calculated the number of hospitals that we need. We need four hospitals if we have uh, to compare to UK, but uh, it's very reassuring that our history of uh, child care started about 115 years ago. So in terms of calculation, we are 50 years behind. And my sincere hope is that we walk through those 50 years, not uh, in another five decades, but much less time. Uh, I, I want to conclude um, uh, promising everyone that all of us pediatricians, the Bulgarian Pediatric Associations, we want to work towards good hospital environment and uh, better care for all Bulgarian patients. And I'm pretty sure that uh, progress cannot be stopped and uh, anyone who is trying to stop progress is kicked off the scene with time. So we look forward to our further collaboration and uh, we do hope that uh, this is the crucial time to go ahead with uh, specific pediatric structures for our children thank you for your attention thank you i see that there are already several questions coming from the audience uh, my uh, uh, i want to ask uh, the people just to point who they want to ask uh, Pointly because uh, sometimes the questions are a little bit confused. Uh, are they uh, oriented to uh, the UK uh, guest or to the Bulgarian participant? Thank you very much. And uh, as I promise you, I want to ask uh, Dr. Puaman Mitev, did he manage to, to resolve the problem with the mic? Dr. Mitev, can you, can you switch on? No, he can't. Okay, I'm sorry for that, but I'm sure that uh, he is uh, open for the, the the discussion after the webinar. Now I will read uh, several of the questions that actually uh, we um, uh, receive from the audience. The first one is coming from Ekaterina Zelenkova, which is asking: You mentioned artificial intelligence included into the plans for future. Can you give us more information about? this. I'm not sure, Ekaterina, is it according to the presentation for the UK hospitals because they have already implemented a good solution for with artificial intelligence or probably connected to uh, Professor Ivanov who is mentioned that in the hospital actually there is. Or probably is there somebody who can answer in this question? Probably also uh, Mr. Babov. What is the situation in a hospital in Sofia? Or otherwise, we will point this uh, question to our uh, guests after the event. And of course, we will send you the, for the uh, answering. Uh, unfortunately, yes, the, the question is not quite clear. The second uh, question that uh, coming from Mr. Douglas Blackwell is how the construction phase of the new hospital taking into account the need to instant renewable energy to uh, mitigate uh, GHG emission. What still steps uh, will be taken? Probably this is uh, mostly a question for Ministry of Health in Bulgaria, uh, according to the, the constructional company that uh, they already uh, choose. Uh, from the Ministry of Health, uh, can you please uh, 
share with us do you have this information right now or you can answer it after the event Demeter Yes, um, thank, you. thank you very much for the question. Um, no, we are not able to give you this information now, but uh, we will be able to respond to you um, a little bit later. Uh, we will send, yes, a written, written response. We will be sending a written response. Thank you. May I comment on something around sustainability? Yes, please. Um, I think um, it's fair to say that we, when we are looking at sustainability issues in a new hospital build, we need to think about whole life costs. It can often appear very expensive to install green technology and um, uh, a technology that allows the building to be more efficient, but actually that saves money in the long term. So adding uh, photovoltaic cells to the roof of a building, if you have space, of course, um, or um, wind turbines in the grounds is, is expensive when you build it, but you're going to save money in the long term. Unfortunately, I think quite often we're very focused on the capital cost of building and we we try to keep that cost as low as we possibly can. And we need to be thinking much more holistically about long term costs and operating models because that way we will be able to have much better uh, technology. Um, we have done a lot of work at Great Ormond Street um, around uh, clean air, um, both internally and externally. Clearly, central London is not very clean. It's much cleaner more recently, I have to say, because there hasn't been so much traffic on the roads during um, COVID lockdown, but it isn't a clean place. And I think we need to work really hard to, to um, clean up the air generally across the capital, but also locally. And, and a hospital in the centre of London can take steps um, to help with that. We have an initiative to try to pedestrianise Great Ormond Street. Anybody who knows Great Ormond Street will know that it's a busy street um, and we are trying to work towards our, our long-term goal to pedestrianise it so that the air in our immediate vicinity is cleaner for children who are coming and going. Uh, we know that poor air quality is very detrimental to children's health uh, and development. And uh, we all need to make efforts to improve that. And hospitals can be part of that um, in uh, being um, ambitious about their, um, about their, their methodology. So for example, um, uh, when we tender for a patient transport contract, we should be asking those contractors to um, use green vehicles and electric vehicles for short journeys um, so that we can contribute to, to, the, to the whole problem. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds uh, quite useful also. Um, in an initial conversation with Professor Violeta Yotova, we discussed um, one of the issues that right now is uh, quite uh, urgent uh, connected to a COVID situation, but I'm very cu curious and my question is for the, the both colleagues from UK, for Mrs. May and for Crispin. How do you organize the digital consultation in these uh, difficult times? What kind of a solution do you use? Hi, um, so we have implemented the um, Attend Anywhere uh, application, uh, which I briefly referred to in the presentation. Um, it's a portal system that enables um, people to just, children and their families to connect through the portal to our consultants so the consultation can take place. Um, and it's recorded as you as it would be if it was done face to face within our Meditech system for our, our healthcare records. We have a protocol to follow to determine which are the best, um, you know, which patients are suitable for, the, for that, having that sort of appointment and which of those do need to come into the hospital so that we can reduce that footfall within our um, environment right now. Um, so yeah, we've been using that and the links with other hospitals and particularly the women's hospitals that we, we clearly work closely for with because of the um, babies being born is the robots as well that we've been able to use so that the consultants can see everything really clearly and get the information that they need. But one of the biggest things that we're looking at working on even more so and we've been using is the HoloLens 2 with Microsoft um, to expand that 
full immersive healthcare for our clinicians and patients. Um, Angie will know more about uh, digital consultation specifically than I will, but I'd make some broad comments. Um, I think what has been interesting is that uh, we are learning that we will probably never revert to the same number of face-to-face -face appointments that we had before COVID. Um, one of the criticisms levelled at Great Ormond Street over the years has been that our children come from a very long distance, that's not a criticism, our children may come from a very long distance and quite often that will be for a 10 minute consultation and they've travelled several hours and they have to travel several hours to get home. We also don't have a car park so they've often had to come on public transport which can be very difficult for some of our children with multiple needs. Um, and uh, perhaps autism, for, for example, it's, it's horrific for an autistic child to travel on public transport. So I think this has forced us to look at more innovative models of consulting. Unless you actually need to examine a child, it may be more appropriate to see them remotely. Um, the other thing is that coordinating appointments is really important. Children with, with uh, very uh, specialised conditions are often under the care of multiple consultants. And when, they, when you do bring them to the hospital for a consultation, we should really be trying to combine that with all the other consultations that they need to have so that they have a, a, a one, one day of appointments rather than coming back on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the next week for, for multiple appointments. So I think we've, we've seen a new model. But the, the other really practical thing is if we do more virtual consultations, we will need less physical space for seeing families. That space can be um, utilised uh, for other uses but also if we don't need as much space we don't incur as much cost it's expensive having a hospital is expensive and if we can make that hospital a little bit smaller or we can use the space more efficiently we will save operating costs thank you yeah, thank you um uh, i'm very happy I... that um, on our discussion we have uh a representative from uh, several uh, of the biggest uh, medical academias in Bulgaria. These are representatives from uh, Plovdiv Medical University, Varna University, Stara Zagora University. I know that actually one of the, the major issue that um, the, the hospitals and uh, even in UK that we all face is as a challenge and the problem is a specialist. Um, I'm wondering, uh, how, uh, and this is my question again to to to, to Crispin and Angie, um, how, how you collaborate with with university? Probably you making more meetings with them, advisory. What types of uh, specialists you are expecting? Because this is uh, one of the the, the most uh, urgent uh, problems right now. How to have the the correct right specialists in a, a certain field and uh, they they're supposed to be prepared in order to go into this new building, this fantastic uh, uh, new hospital that uh, I hope soon that we will have. What is your experience in this matter? And probably uh, afterward, I will ask uh, my colleagues to, to share the final, uh, the, the final things. Uh, thank you. Crispin, Angie. I was going to let Angie go first because I know that the older hay has a as an, as an excellent um, uh, setup for, um, uh, for the university, um, and then I can comment. Thank you. Yeah, part of the um, institute building that um, we mentioned in the in the presentation um, hosts the academy, and we have long-standing partnerships with our universities, and we have I think it's. Uh, they're, they're on our partnership. I think it's about six of them all together. I think um, one, two, three, yeah, six of them um, that we partner partner with. And we, when we were building the institute building, we worked in partnership with the universities to understand what space that they felt that they required as part of that as well. So they are actually um, located, co-located with us in the hospital, which really helps so they can come in and they can use that space, um, including things like clinical labs um, as well. Um, so we've built on those relationships that we've had for, for decades with our universities in terms of research and our clinical expertise. We have joint appointments between universities across all, all of the professional groups, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, um, with um, some of their role being taken part in the university and some being at Old Hay. And of course, that always helps with an exchange of ideas in quite an informal way as well as a formal way. Um, so 
yeah, that, and we're just working with them all the time with the doctors coming through for their training, the nurses coming through and the allied health professionals. So yeah, we've had a long-standing partnership and we hope that that continues. Uh, and Great Ormond Street's um, academic partnership is with University College London, which many of you will know, um, and specifically the Institute of Child Health, which is part of the university. Um, in fact, when I showed that plan of our site, uh, the, uh, the red box that had a corner missing off it, that corner is uh, a piece of land that we'd love to have, but is actually where the Institute of Child Health is located. And anyone who's visited Great Ormond Street will know that the academic partnership is really critical to our research activity particularly and as, as Angie has mentioned at Old Hay we similarly have a lot of joint appointments where our senior clinicians um, are, have a joint appointment with the university for their research studies and their clinical activity with Great Ormond Street. Our most recent building that we opened um, is the uh, Zaid Centre for Research into Rare Disease in Children a name which really trips off the tongue. Um, and uh, that building is particularly aimed at um, celebrating research and making research visible to children and families. Um, one of the ambitions around being a research hospital rather than a hospital does research is that children will be aware of the research that's going on around them, will know about research activities, will be educated about conditions and their treatment, and that um, our researchers and, and scientists Scientists will see, will have contact with the children who's, um, who will benefit from the, the treatments that they are developing. So that building has a very large lab at basement level, which is open to the ground floor. And as children enter that building for outpatient clinics, they can look down into that lab and they can see all of that activity going on. And for us, that's really important that the, the, the boundaries between research and clinical activity, the re boundaries between academia and clinical activity are broken down so that they're a much more collaborative model is developed. Developed. Thank you, thank you. And uh, probably I will uh, ask again uh, the, the colleagues from the university to share what are their uh, vision on how to improve this connection between the hospital and the specialty that, that, that are actually uh, uh, studied into the university and starting from uh, Professor Yotovo, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. In fact, uh, this is a question that is so tackled also in our environment because uh, our hospitals uh, currently are part of the universities. So we are one and the same thing and uh, every, uh, we don't uh, call them consultant, but senior doctor is also uh, teaching at the university. And we also try to do research studies, try to help uh, children with rare diseases. And we also have uh, expert centers for rare diseases. But what we really don't have is space dedicated to children, entirely to children and multidisciplinary teams that are made entirely from uh, pediatric specialists. Now we have to um, deliver care with specialists that are not only uh, from the pediatric background. And uh, this is always sensed in a way by families. I'm every day working with many families, many of them new to me, and I can really uh, grasp this because uh, as a parent, as a, a caregiver, you want to see that all the environment is open for your needs and uh, uh, for your uh, current situation. Uh, when we have a, a sick child, we're egoists in a way, and uh, the environment and the people, the team, everyone has to, to meet this. We have to work uh, towards this. Please do something to introduce digital care in Bulgaria officially. I wrote a short comment because during the COVID crisis, all of us did uh, deliver care uh, digitally. And this was a very high quality care. We are not different from the rest of the world uh, that uh, already reported on, for example, improving diabetes care during the lockdown down, down time. Because we, in practice, we dedicated more time to our, pa to our patients. This has to be officially accepted in Bulgaria. For the moment, it's not, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Dr. Slavov, can you add something according to the topic and closing remarks? Dr. Slavov, are you online? Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, I think that uh, this is uh, one uh, very important and very interesting discussion uh, 
uh, based on the um, uh, green uh, deal in green, uh, green uh, uh, man of life, uh, we must uh, do everything uh, to study our uh, children, to um, uh, to be uh, how to be held, how to um, uh, how to feel in this uh, green uh, manner of life. Because now everything is very different, very strange. Uh, related also with uh, COVID situation, and uh, we must be uh, able to uh, to work uh, very hard uh, uh, for the children's health. Thank you, and Thank you. Professor Ivanov, can you add something, Professor Ivanov? Are you online? Uh, he's he, he's yeah, muted. I just muted the mic. Uh, I completely agree with Professor Yotova because she said major issues. Uh, my left hand is uh, academic and my right hand is uh, clinic, clinical, so it's one one the same body. Uh, this is a, a, a very good situation in all university hospitals. I think this is one of the uh, best. Uh, uh, issues that provide uh, good good care, uh, good good uh, health care to our, to our patients. Uh, really, uh, maybe we, we have two issues here in, in this uh, in, in this uh, meeting. Uh, one of the issues is uh, the uh, the ability to foresee the future needs when you build a new hospital and how to make uh, the best plans. So. Uh, not to solve uh, current issues, uh, but uh, future issues that we don't know which, which what they are, which is something completely uh, it's, it's it's very difficult. Uh, and uh, I think this uh, is uh, we we can uh, have some help in this uh, situation uh, from our colleagues from uh, UK. And the second issue is. Uh, uh, this uh, electronic world we live in, and uh, that is. Uh, 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 even more important in this uh, COVID crisis uh, with uh, uh, distance meetings and distance consultations and uh, uh, to, to the idea to provide uh, uh, is this current information without, uh, with, without, without a personal touch. Uh, so in this, uh, also in this field, we can have uh, some uh, uh, help and advice uh, from our colleagues. I'm afraid that uh, this help and advice uh, will won't be uh, practically applied in the same scale as in UK, uh, because we see that, uh, for example, uh, they have donations and they have uh, good, uh, um, let's say, uh, good, they, they have established good relations with Microsoft and such big companies. Uh, perhaps that won't be available in Bulgaria, but anyway, uh, some of the issues and some of the practicals, I think, uh, uh, could be implemented at home. At least the protocols of these uh, sessions would be uh, implemented because I know that the uh, UK is very keen on uh, legal issues uh, about uh, spread information, about confidentiality, uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, the, doc the, 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 the doctor's obligations and also the doctor's rights. Uh, so uh, issues like these protocols, I think, will be quite helpful and could be much easily impl implemented. Otherwise, the technology may be a bit more difficult, but we'll let's see. We'll see what's going on. It's an open question. Thank you. Because we are running out of time, uh, I want to provide a closing remarks to the guests into the studio <laughs> who is making me a company professor Fusov, please uh, very briefly uh, closing remarks of bulgaria imamo jedin golem problem of the connection to continual medical education to ne je zadolžitelno za naši daleke i tuka se sozdava ena mnogo loša obstanovka 
защото между академичното тяло, нека да кажем така, и цялата маса от останали лекари няма задължителна връзка. Мисля, че колегите от България добре ме разбраха, да ме разберат и колегите от Великобритания. А, второто, което искам да кажа и съм предизвикан от а, въпроса за възможността да се правят онлайн консултации и така нататък, за голямо съжаление а, онлайн консултации трябва да се правят не само с самите пациенти, а самите лекари помежду си би трябвало да общуват много по-активно, което е напълно технологично възможно в момента, особено когато има трудни случаи, но това не е възприето като практика в нашата страна, пък може би и не навсякъде другата. И може би тук ще намериме почва и възможност за взаимно сътрудничество. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will make something extraordinary, but a uh, few of you know that actually the, the major host of this event is supposed to be the young boy, who is unfortunately because of the uh, COVID situation couldn't manage to join us to the studio, but still I want to provide him a stage for very one brief uh, uh, closing remark. Dejan, can you please? Thank you very much, Christy. So I just want to thank everybody here uh for being here and uh, for the embassy to organizing it, the BioCluster, the BBBA, and especially Chrissy, which has hosted all this event. Due to COVID uh, in our school, I had to be at home. But uh, again, thanks to COVID, we are able all together together and to discuss this topic. For me personally, child, uh, ch children health is very important. I think for everyone is, and I'm sure this is a good start of future relationships and let's have other meetings in the future to make it happen. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so it's time to finish this lovely webinar. Uh, video recording of the meeting will be spread uh, in our network. Again, a special thanks uh, to all the organizers, but also to the team behind the stage. I want to provide a special thanks to Rosalina Yerakova, Emilia Pecheva, Georgi Bonev, Trifun Mikhailov, Elena Yurdanova, Desimiteva, the Yambo God, and everybody who supported this event. Uh, stay tuned for more meetings of our series and have a safety and inspirational day. Thank you. Bye-bye.